at Texas A&M, a group led by Professor John Bockrath, who is widely regarded as one of the world's greatest electrochemists, reported finding the hydrogen isotope tritium, a key signature that some unusual nuclear reaction was going on. The, the first thing was this, uh, this, this uh, thing called tritium, which was a, uh, a, a sub-form of hydrogen which should not exist uh, except in extremely tiny quantities. We found that by working these uh, cells of Fleischmann and Pons uh, containing lithium hydroxide and deuterium oxide, that we could produce this tritium in great abundance let's say, at uh, 10,000 times more than it ought to be there, as it were. And um, let, me, let me stress that we couldn't do it every time, but about one result in five or one result in four, and eventually we worked up to two results out of three, um, we could produce tritium. That was the first thing, and, and in a way it was the first clear proof of the phenomenon. Halfway around the world, at the Baba Atomic Research Center in India, Dr. Mahadeva Srinivasan provided confirmation. Within a few weeks, within two or three weeks, we got the first results, and several groups started saying, yes, we are seeing excess heat, and, uh, but the most important and unbelievable phenomenon at that time was the observation of tritium. Back at Texas A&M, Bakris's group found themselves under attack. Science magazine writer Gary Tobbs wrote a stinging article that insinuated that someone in the group had spiked the samples with tritium. Although unfounded and eventually proved untrue, the allegation effectively dampened Bacchus's remarkable claims. Well, I was 69 years old at that time, and I took the attitude, suppose they fire me, right? It doesn't really matter. I had my career. The worst they could do would be to say, go. Your tenure is withdrawn. And uh, therefore, I wasn't frightened. And I went on saying the truth and publishing what we'd got. And, but finally, the university uh, revolted against this. and uh, They set up an inquiry, uh, as they called it, rather sinisterly. The accusation was that I had carried out misconduct of research. You see, I shouldn't have worked on these things. And they decided that the accusations were totally groundless, and they published all this. But then they started all again about six months later and they had another committee. It was this time uh, when my lawyers asked the university what the second inquiry was about. They were told it's an ad hoc committee. What's that? Um, we have nothing further to tell you. And so this went on for 11 months of uh, constant meetings and inquiries and so on. And I'm quite sure that uh, they were trying to find an excuse to end my tenure, you see. Getting tenure in most traditional uh, science departments depends on doing mainstream research. Being a leader in mainstream research, but doing mainstream research, and not doing fringe area research, investigating things like cold fusion. Uh, once you're tenured, uh, it's a bit of a different story in that, uh, in principle, you can investigate any field you like, and people have done that. But even then, uh, the way things are connected uh, with money and power in universities today, uh, your life can be made rather difficult if you are identified with those areas. Finally, they came out uh, okay. I mean, they gave me another letter. I'd had the letter of complete exoneration. This time it said that they had uh, spent this 11 months and had found that I had never done anything, the phrase used were, uh, that contravene the rules of procedure of this university, or something rather formal and stuffy like that. Normally we'd say someone's uh, innocent until proven guilty, and you'd be given the opportunity to have a trial rather than having an article written about what you've done wrong <laughs> and identify as being guilty in the, in the press rather than... Uh, uh, due process. Anyway, all these things were happening and uh, it uh, just makes one sad. But I think the main part was that I had done work which was against the paradigm and that was what they were really upset about. You know, people said that they'd been to other universities and people had laughed at it and said, 
what the heck are you doing trying to disprove the laws of nuclear physics? And of course, that's exactly what we were doing <laughs> and succeeding, you see. Even though positive results were still coming in, the Department of Energy's negative report effectively killed congressional funding in the United States. Fleischmann and Pons later packed their bags and left for France to carry on private research sponsored by the Toyota Corporation. By 1992, we had video recordings of intense energy release. By the summer of 1994, we had demonstrated sustained energy release. That, of course, if you say you want, you wish to make this into a device, required further research. And we were always working on a time frame of trying to get to that point by about the year 2000. And I think that if the resources had been available, we would have got to the year, to that, that, that particular point, probably before the year 2000. But uh, this did not happen. Despite the critics, research on cold fusion did not disappear. By 1999, eight major international conferences had been held. Several thousand technical papers had been written by hundreds of scientists in peer-reviewed journals and technical magazines. Strong evidence that continues to mount up against the solitary DOE report. In the U.S., the Electric Power Research Institute, whose members include dozens of major utility corporations, spent over $10 million to investigate the claims of Fleischmann and Pons. In its final report in 1994, EPRI concluded that the production of excess heat had been confirmed and definite evidence of nuclear reactions were detected. When the uh, ERAB panel came through with Heizenga as the chairman on July the 6th, 19. 89 to visit, they were looking very uh, lightly at the heat measurements and very strongly at the absence of neutrons and tritium. And um, we had already admitted that there were none. Obviously, we were still alive. <coughs> so um, anyway, uh, my feeling was that um, once they saw no neutrons and tritium, they could use that to um, denounce the field and protect their budgets. And Fascinatingly, uh, many of the people on that panel, a couple of them I should say, came to me looking for research funds in this, on this, in this field, even though publicly they were uh, speaking before Congress against having Congress put any money in it. Which, which goes to prove to you that uh, the search for money in research is a very big thing and it uh, sometimes takes precedence over the search, what we would call for pure truth. In the mid-90s, the government of Japan funded an official cold fusion program under the banner of New Hydrogen Energy. Despite its short life, today many Japanese scientists and companies quietly conduct sophisticated experimentation. The Italian and French governments have begun their own research. In the U.S., scientists at government facilities like Los Alamos and the Naval Air Warfare Center at China Lake, California have reported definitive observations. In the commercial sector, many small startup companies continue this revolutionary line of work, even securing patents, while carefully avoiding the stigma of being labeled cold fusion. <laughs> 